the tribunal please the next and final subject of the criminal organizations is the general staff and high command to be presented by Colonel Taylor. Colonel Taylor. Your Lordship, members of the tribunal. The indictment seeks a declaration of criminality under Articles 9 to 11 of the Charter against six groups or organizations. And the last one listed in the indictment is described, is a group described as the General Staff and High Command of the German Armed Forces. At first sight, these six groups and organizations seem to differ rather widely one from another, both in their composition and in their functions. But all of them are related, and we believe that they are logically indicted together before the tribunal because they are the primary agencies and the chief tools by means of which the Nazi conspirators sought to achieve their aims. All six of them were either established by, controlled by, or became allied with the Nazis, and they were essential to the success of the Nazis. They were at once the principal and indispensable instruments the party, the government, the police, and the armed forces. It is my task to present the case in chief against the general staff and high command group. Now, in one respect, this group is to be sharply distinguished from the other groups and organizations against which we have sought this declaration. For example, the leadership core of the Nazi party, of the NSDAP, is the leadership core of the party itself, the party which was the embodiment of Nazism, and which was the instrument primarily through which Hitlerism rose to full power and tyranny in Germany. The SA and the SS were branches, to be sure large branches, of the Nazi party. The German police did indeed have certain roots and antecedents which antedated Hitlerism, but it became 99% a creature of the Nazi party and state. The Reich cabinet was in essence merely a committee or a series of committees of Reich ministers. And when the Nazis came to power, quite naturally, these ministerial positions were filled for the most part by Nazis. All these other groups and organizations, accordingly, either owe their origin and development to Nazism or automatically became Nazified when Hitler came to power. Now, that is not true of the group with which we are now concerned. <clears throat> I need not remind the tribunal that German armed might and the German military tradition antedate Hitlerism by many decades. One need not be a graybeard to have very vivid personal recollections of the war of 1914 to 18, of the Kaiser, and of the scrap of paper. For these reasons, I want to sketch very briefly, before going into the evidence, the nature of our case against this group, which is unique in the particulars I've mentioned. As a result of the German defeat in 1918 and the Treaty of Versailles, the size and the permissible scope of activities of the German armed forces was severely restricted. <clears throat> that these restrictions did not destroy or even seriously undermine German militarism, the last few years have made abundantly apparent. The full flowering of German military strength came about through collaboration 
collaboration between the Nazis on the one hand and the career leaders of the German armed forces, the professional soldiers, sailors, and airmen. When Hitler came to power, he did not find a vacuum in the field of military affairs. He found a small Reichswehr and a body of professional officers with a morale and outlook nourished by German military history. The leaders of these professional officers constitute the group named in the indictment, the general staff and high command of the German armed forces. This part of the case concerns that group of men. <clears throat> now, needless to say, it is not the prosecution's position that it is a crime to be a soldier or a sailor or to serve one's country as a soldier or a sailor in time of war. The profession of arms is an honorable one and can be honorably practiced. But it is too clear for argument that a man who commits crimes cannot plead as a defense that he committed them in uniform. Now, it is not in the nature of things, and it is not the prosecution's position that every member of this group was a wicked man, or that they were all equally culpable. <clears throat> but it, we will show that this group not only collaborated with Hitler and supported the essential Nazi objectives, we will show that they furnished the one thing which was essential and basic to the success of the Nazi program for Germany, and that was skill and experience in the development and use of armed might. Why did this group support Hitler and the Nazis? <coughs> I think your honors will see, as the proof is given, that the answer is very simple. The answer is that they agreed with the truly basic objectives of Hitlerism and Nazism, and that Hitler gave the generals <coughs> the opportunity to play a major part in achieving these objectives. The generals, like Hitler, wanted to aggrandize Germany at the expense of neighboring countries and were prepared to do so by force or threat of force. Force, armed might, was the keystone of the arch, the thing without which nothing else would have been possible. As they came to power, and when they had attained power, the Nazis had two alternatives, either to collaborate with and expand the small German army, known as the Reichswehr, or to ignore the Reichswehr and build up a separate army of their own. The generals feared that the Nazis might do the latter, and accordingly were the more inclined to collaborate. Moreover, the Nazis offered the generals the chance of achieving much that they wished to achieve by way of expanding German arms and German frontiers. And so, as we will show, the generals climbed onto the Nazi bandwagon. They saw it was going in their direction for the present. No doubt they hoped later to take over the direction themselves. In fact, as the proof will show, ultimately, it was the generals who were taken for a ride by the Nazis. Hitler, in short, attracted the generals to him with the glitter of conquest and then succeeded in submerging them politically. And as the war proceeded, they became his tools. But if these military leaders became the tools of Nazism, it is not to be supposed that they were unwitting <clears throat> or that they did not participate fully in many of the crimes which we will bring to the notice of the tribunal. The willingness and indeed the eagerness of the German professional officer corps to become partners of the Nazis will be fully developed. Now, Your Lordship, <clears throat> there will be three principal parts of this presentation. There will be first a description of the composition and functioning of the general staff and high command group as defined in the indictment. 
Next, <clears throat> the evidence in support of the charge of criminality under counts one and two of the indictment. Finally, the evidence in support of the charges under counts three and four. The members of the tribunal should have before them three document books, which have been given the number CC, double C. <coughs> the first of these books is a series of sworn statements or affidavits, which are available to the tribunal in English and in Russian and in French, and which have been available to the defendants in German. The second and third books are the usual type of document books, separated merely for convenience of handling. The second book contains documents in the C and L series, and the third book in the PS and R series. For the convenience of the tribunal, we have handed up a list of these documents in the order in which they will be referred to. The tribunal should also have one other document, and that is a short mimeographed statement entitled Basic Information on the Organization of the German Armed Forces. That has also been handed up in English, Russian, and French, and has also been made available to the Defendant's Information Center in German. So I turn first to a description of the group as defined in the indictment. <coughs> During the First World War, there was an organization in the German armed forces known as the Great General Staff. This name, the German General Staff, or Great General Staff, persists in the public mind. But the Grosse General Stab no longer exists in fact. There has been no such single organization, no single German general staff since 1918. But there has, of course, been a group of men responsible for the policy and the acts of the German armed forces. And the fact that these men have no single collective name does not prevent us from collecting them together men cannot escape the consequences of their collective acts by combining, combining informally instead of formally. The essence of a general staff or a high command lies not in the name you give it, but in the functions it performs. And the men comprised within the group, as we have defined it in the indictment, do constitute a functional group welded together by common responsibility of those officers who had the principal authority and responsibility under Hitler for the plans and operations of the German armed forces. Let us examine first the general structure and organization of the German armed forces, and then look at the composition of the group as specified in the indictment. As I just mentioned, we have prepared a very short written exposition of the organization of the German armed forces, which we have handed up to the tribunal. That document contains a short sketch setting forth the basic history and development of the supreme command of the German armed forces since 1933, and the structure as it emerged after its reorganization in 1938. It also contains a simple chart, which in a few moments will be displayed at the front of the courtroom. It also contains a short glossary of German military expressions. And it contains a comparative table of ranks in the German army and in the SS, showing the equivalent ranks in the American army and the equivalent ranks for the German Navy and the British Navy. I may say that military and naval ranks differ slightly among the principal nations, but that by and large they follow the same general pattern and terminology. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, the German armed forces were controlled 
by a Reich defense minister, who at that time was Field Marshal Werner von Blomberg. <clears throat> Under von Blomberg were the chief of the army staff, who at that time was von Fritsch, and of the naval staff, the defendant Raider. Owing to the limitations imposed on Germany by the Treaty of Versailles, the German Air Force at that time had no official existence whatever. <coughs> In May 1935, at the time that military conscription was introduced in Germany, there was a change in the titles of these offices, but the structure remained basically the same. Field Marshal von Blomberg remained in supreme command of the armed forces with the title of Reich Minister for War and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. Von Fritsch assumed the title Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Raider Commander-in-Chief of the Navy. The German Air Force came into official and open existence at about this same time, but it was not put under von Blomberg. It was an independent institution under the personal command of the defendant Goering, who had the double title of Air Minister and Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force. I'll now ask that chart be displayed, please. The chart, Your Honors, has been certified and sworn to by three principal German generals, and the affidavits with reference to it will be introduced in a few moments. It shows the organization, the top organization of the armed forces, as it emerged in 1938 after the reorganization, which I will now describe. In February 1938, von Blomberg and von Fritsch were both retired from their positions, and Blomberg's ministry, the war ministry, was wound up. The war ministry had contained <coughs> a division or department called the Wehrmacht Amt, meaning the Armed Forces Department. And the function of that department had been to coordinate the plans and operations of the Army and Navy. From this Armed Forces Department <coughs> was formed a new overall Armed Forces Authority, known as the High Command of the German Armed Forces. That is the box in the center, right under Hitler. <coughs> Known in German as <coughs> Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, and usually known by the initials OKW. Since the Air Force, as well as the Army, was subordinated to OKW, coordination of all armed forces matters was vested in the OKW, which was really Hitler's personal staff for these matters. The defendant Keitel was appointed chief of the OKW, and the most important division of the OKW, shown just to the right, was the operations staff, of which the defendant Yodel became the chief. Now, this reorganization <coughs> and the establishment of OKW was embodied in a decree issued by Hitler on the 4th of February, 1938. This decree appeared in the Reichsgesetzblatt, <coughs> and I invite the court's attention to it by way of judicial notice. Copies are available 
and I would like to read the decree, which is very short, into the transcript. I quote, Command authority over the entire armed forces is from now on exercised directly by me personally. That is not a document, Your Honor, because it is a decree from the Rice Cassettes plot and subject to judicial notice. But copies are available here if the tribunal cares to look at it. I continue with the second paragraph of this decree. The Armed Forces Department in the Reich War Ministry with its functions becomes the high command of the armed forces and comes directly under my command as my military staff. The head of the staff of the high command of the armed forces is the chief of the former armed forces department with the title of chief of the high command of the armed forces. His status is equal to that of a Reich minister. The high command of the armed forces also takes over the affairs of the Reich war ministry. The chief of the high command of the armed forces as my representative exercises the functions hitherto exercised by the Reich War Minister. The High Command of the Armed Forces is responsible in peacetime for the unified preparation of the defense of the Reich in all areas according to my directives. Berlin, 4th of February, signed by Hitler, by Lammers, and by Keitel. Underneath the OKW come the three supreme commands of the three branches of the armed forces, OKH, OKM, and the Air Force. The Air Force <coughs> didn't receive the official designation OKL until 1944. Now, the defendant Raider remained, after 1938, as Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, but von Fritsch, as well as Blomberg, passed out of the picture, von Fritsch being replaced by von Brauchitsch as Commander-in-Chief of the Army. Goering continued as Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force. <clears throat> In 1941, Von Brauchitz was replaced as Commander-in-Chief of the Army, that is the first box in the left column, by Hitler himself. And in 1943, Raider was replaced as Commander-in-Chief of the Navy by the defendant Dönitz. The defendant Göring continued as Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force until the last month of the war. OKW, OKH, OKM, and OKL each had its own staff. These four staffs did not have uniform designations. <clears throat> they are the, the three staffs of the Army, Navy, and Air Force are the three boxes in a horizontal line next to the bottom. <coughs> the staff of OKW is the little box to the right at the top, bearing the names of Yodel and Varlamont. In the case of OKH, that is the Army, the staff was known as the Generalstab, or General Staff. In the case of OKW, it was known as the Führungstab, or Operations Staff. But in all cases, <coughs> the functions were those of a General Staff, in military parlance. It will be seen, therefore, that in this war, there was no single German general staff, but rather that there were four, one for each branch of the service, 
and one for the OKW as the overall inter-service supreme command. <clears throat> so we come to the, to the bottom line on the chart. Down to the bottom line, we have been concerned with the central staff organization at the center of affairs. Now we pass to the field. <coughs> Under OKH, OKM, and OKL came the various fighting formations of the Army, Air Force, and Navy, respectively. In the Army, the largest Army field formation was known to the Germans, as indeed it is among the nations generally, as an army group, or in German, Harris Group. Those are shown in the box in the lower left-hand corner. An army group, or Harris Group, controls two or more armies, in German, Armee. Underneath the armies come the lower field formations such as corps, divisions, and regiments, which are not shown on the chart. In the case of the German Air Force, the largest formation was known as an air fleet, or Luftflotte. And the lower units under the air fleet were called corps, Flieger Corps, or Jagd Corps, or divisions. Fliegerdivisionen or Jagdivisionen, those lower formations again we have not shown on the chart. Under OKM were the various naval group commands <coughs> which controlled all naval operations in a given area with the exception of the high seas fleet itself and submarines. The commanders of the fleet and the submarines were directly under the German admiral. So we may now examine the group as defined in the indictment, the group against which the prosecution seeks the declaration of criminality. It is defined in Appendix B of the indictment. The group comprises, firstly, German officers who held the top positions in the four supreme commands which I have just described, and secondly, the officers who held the top field commands. Turning first to the officers who held the principal positions in the supreme commands, we find that the holders of nine such positions are included in the group. <clears throat> Four of these are positions of supreme authority. The chief of the OKW, Keitel, the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, von Brauchitz and later Hitler, Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, Raider and later Dönitz, Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force, Göring and later von Grahn. Four other positions are those of the Chiefs of Staff to those four Commanders-in-Chief. The Chief of the Operations Staff of the OKW, Yodel, the General Staff of the Army, Halder and later others, the Chief of the General Staff of the Air Force, Yashanik and later others, the Chief of the Naval War Staff. The ninth position is that of Deputy Chief of the Operations <coughs> Staff of OKW. Throughout most of the war, that was General Varlamont, whose name is shown underneath Yodel's on the chart. The particular responsibility of Yodel's deputy was planning, strategic planning. And for that reason, his office has been included in the group as defined in the indictment. The group named in the indictment includes all individuals who held any of those nine staff positions between February 1938 and the end of the war in 
in May 1945. February 1938 was selected as the opening date because it was in that month that the top organization of the German armed forces was reorganized and assumed substantially the form in which you see it there and in which it persisted up to the end of the war. Twenty-two different individuals occupied those nine positions during that period. And of those 22, 18 are still living. Turning next to the officers who held the principal field commands, the indictment includes, as members of the group, all commanders in chief in the field who had the status of Oberbefehlshaber in the Army, Navy, or Air Force. The term Oberbefehlshaber rather defies literal translation into English. Literally, the components of the word mean over command holder. And we can perhaps best translate it as commander in chief. In the case of the Army, commanders of army groups and armies always had the status and title of Oberbefehlshaber. <coughs> in the Air Force, the commanders in chief of air fleets, Luftflotte, always had the status of an Oberbefehlshaber, although they, did, though they didn't get the formal designation until 1944. In the Navy, <clears throat> officers holding the senior regional commands and therefore in control of all naval operations in a given sector had the status of Oberbefehlshaber. Roughly 110 individual officers had the status of Oberbefehlshaber in the Army, Navy, or Air Force during the period in question. And all but approximately a dozen of them are still alive. <coughs> the entire general staff and high command group, as defined in the indictment, comprises about 130 officers, of whom 114 are believed to be still living. Those figures, of course, are the cumulative total of all officers who at any time belonged to the group during the seven years and three months from February 1938 to May 1945. <coughs> the number of active members of the group at any one moment is, of course, much smaller. That was about 20 at the outbreak of the war and it rose to about 50 in 1944 and 1945. That is to say <clears throat> that at any one moment of time in 1944, the group, the active group, would have consisted of the nine individuals <coughs> occupying the nine staff positions and about 41 Naval, Air Force, or Army, Commanders-in-Chief. The structure and the functioning of the German General Staff and High Command Group has been described in a series of affidavits by some of the principal German Field Marshals and Generals. These aff affidavits are included in Document Book 1. I want to state briefly how these statements <coughs> were obtained. In the first place, two American officers who were selected for their ability and experience in interviewing high-ranking German prisoners of war were briefed by an intelligence officer and by trial counsel on the particular problems presented by this part of the case, the organizational side 
the German armed forces. These officers were already well versed in military intelligence and were fluent in German. It was emphasized that the function of these interrogating officers was merely to inquire into and establish the facts with respect to the organization of the armed forces and to establish facts on which the prosecution wanted to be accurately informed. The German generals to be interrogated were selected on the basis of the special knowledge which they could be presumed to possess by reason of the positions which they had held in the past. After each interview, the interrogator prepared a report. And from this report, such facts as appeared relevant to the issues before the tribunal were extracted and a statement embodying them was prepared. This statement was then presented to the German officer at a later interview in the form of a draft. And the German officer was asked whether it was truly reproduced what he had said and was invited to alter it in any way he saw fit. The object was to procure the most accurate testimony on organizational matters that we could. I will take up these affidavits one by one. And I think the members of the tribunal will see that they fully support the prosecution's description of the group and conclusively establish that this group of officers was in fact the group which had the major responsibility for planning and for directing the operation of the German armed forces. The Soviet and French judges have copies in French and Russian. The defense has been furnished with copies in German. The first of these affidavits is that of Franz Halder. who held the rank of General Oberst, or Colonel General, the equivalent of a four-star general in the American Army. His affidavit will be U.S. Exhibit 531-531. Halder was chief... Halder was chief of the general staff of OKH. That would be the box second from the bottom on the left-hand side. Chief of the general staff of OKH from September 1938 to September 1942. He is accordingly a member of the group and well qualified by his position <coughs> to testify as to the organization. His statement is short, and I will read it in full. <coughs> Ultimate authority and responsibility for military affairs in Germany was vested in the head of state, who prior to the 2nd of August, 1934, was Field Marshal von Hindenburg, and thereafter until 1945, was Adolf Hitler. Specialized military matters <coughs> were the responsibility of the three branches of the armed forces subordinate to the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, at the same time head of state. That is to say, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. In practice, supervision within this field was exercised by a relatively small group of high-ranking officers. These officers exercised such supervision in their official capacity and by virtue of their training, their positions, and their mutual contacts. Plans for military operations of the German armed forces were prepared by members of this group according to the instructions of the OKW in the name of their respective commanding officers and were presented by them to 
from the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, at the same time the Head of the State. The members of this group were charged with the responsibility of preparing for military operations within their competent fields, and they actually did prepare for any such operations as were to be undertaken by troops in the field. Prior to any operation, members of this group were assembled and given appropriate directions by the head of state. Examples of such meetings are the speech by Hitler to the commanders in chief on 22 August 1939, <coughs> prior to the Polish campaign, and the consultation at the Reich Chancellery on 14 June 1941, prior to the first Russian campaign. The composition of this group and the relationship of its members to each other <coughs> were as shown in the attached chart. This was, in effect, the general staff and high command of the German Armed Forces, signed Halder. The chart to which reference is made is the chart at the front of the room and which was attached to the affidavit. The two meetings referred to in the last paragraph of the affidavit are covered by documents which will be introduced subsequently. I next offer a substantially identical statement by von Braukich, which will be Exhibit USA 532. Von Braukich held the rank of Field Marshal and was Commander-in-Chief of the Army from 1938 to 1941, therefore also a member of the group. I need not read his statement, since it is practically the same as that given by Halder, but I will ask that it be set forth in full in the transcript at this point. The only difference between the two statements is in the last sentence of each. Halder states that the group described in the indictment, quote, was in effect the general staff and high command of the German armed forces, unquote. Whereas von Braukitsch puts it a little differently, saying, quote, in the hands of those who filled the positions shown in the chart lay the actual direction of the armed forces. Unquote. Otherwise, the two statements are identical. Now, the tribunal will see from these affidavits that the chart which is on display at the front of the court and which is contained in the short expository statement has been laid before von Braukitsch and Halder, and that these two officers have vouched for it under oath as an accurate picture the top organization of the German Armed Forces. The statements by Braukitsch and Halder also fully support the prosecution's statement that the holders of the positions shown on this chart constitute the group in whom lay the major responsibility for the planning and execution of all Armed Forces matters. I would now like to offer another affidavit by Halder, which sets forth some of the matters of detail to which I have adverted in describing the group. It is quite short. It's affidavit number six, which becomes Exhibit USA 533. And I will read it in full into the transcript. The quote, the most important department in the OKW was the operations staff. In much the same way as the general staff was in the Army and the Air Force and the Naval War Staff in the Navy. Under Keitel, 
there were a number of departmental chiefs who were equal in status with Yoden. But in the planning and conduct of military affairs, they and their departments were less important and less influential than Yodel and Yodel staff. The OKW operations staff was also divided into sections. Of these, the most important was the section of which Varlamont was the chief. It was called the National Defense Section and was primarily concerned with the development of strategic questions. From 1941 onwards, Varlamont, though charged with the same duties, was known as Deputy Chief of the OKW Operations Staff. There was, during World War II, no unified general staff, such as the great general staff which operated in World War I. Operational matters for the Army and Air Force were worked out by the group of high-ranking officers described in my statement of 7 November in the Army, General Staff of the Army, and in the Air Force, General Staff of the Air Force. Operational matters in the Navy were even in World War I not worked out by the great General Staff, but by the Naval Staff, signed Hong. The tribunal will note that this affidavit is primarily concerned with the functions of the general staffs of the four commanders of OKW, OKL, OKM, and OKH, and fully supports the inclusion in the group of the chiefs of staff of the four services, as well as the inclusion of Varlamont as deputy chief of the OKW staff because of his strategic planning responsibilities. I have just one other very short affidavit covering a matter of detail. The tribunal will remember that the highest fighting formation in the German Air Force was known as an air fleet or Luftflotte and that all commanders in chief of air fleets are included in this group. That is the box in the lower right hand corner. The commanders of air fleets always had the status of an Oberbefehlshaber, but they were not formally so designated until 1944. These facts are set forth in an affidavit by the son of Field Marshal von Brauchitsch. His son had the rank of Oberst, or Colonel, in the German Air Force, and was personal aide to the defendant Goering as Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force. His affidavit is number nine, becomes US 534. And it reads as follows. Luftplot and chefs have the same status as the Oberbefehlshaber of an army. During the war, they had no territorial juristic authority and accordingly exercised no territorial jurisdiction. They were the highest troop commanders of the Air Force units subordinate to them and were directly under the command of the Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force. Until the summer of 1944, they bore the designation the Failshaber, and from then on, that of Oberbefehlshaber. This change of designation carried with it no change in the functions and responsibilities which they previously had. Now, Your Honor, that concludes the description of the composition of the group. Uh, personnel of the tribunal, staff of the tribunal, have referred to me two inquiries which have been addressed to the tribunal by counsel for the group. 
And it <clears throat> seemed to me that it might be appropriate if I disposed of those now. Those inquiries are as to the composition of the group. The letters were turned over to me two days ago. The first is from Hofrat Dillmann, and he has asked whether the group as defined in the indictment is contingent upon rank, whether it includes officers holding a definite rank, such as field marshal or general oberst. The answer to that is clearly no. <clears throat> as has been pointed out, the criterion of membership in the group is whether one held one of the positions on the chart up there. And one would be in the group if one held one of those positions no matter what one's rank. Rank is no criterion. In point of fact, I suppose everybody in the group held at least the rank of general in the German army, which is the equivalent of lieutenant general in ours. And he has also asked whether the group includes officers of the so-called general staff corps. The answer to that is no. There was, in the German army, a war academy, and graduates of the war academy were given the branch of service, a branch of service described as the general staff corps. They signed themselves, <coughs> Colonel im Generalstab. They functioned largely as adjutants and assistants to staff officers. I suppose there were some thousands of them, two or three thousand. But they are not included in the group. Many of them were officers of junior rank. They are not named in the indictment. There is no reason there, there is no respect in which they are comprehended within the group as defined. The other letter of inquiry is from Dr. Exner, who states that he is in doubt as to the meaning of Oberbefehlshaber and goes on to state that he believes that Oberbefehlshaber includes commanders-in-chief in theaters of war, the commanders-in-chief of army groups, and the commanders-in-chief of armies. And that is quite right. Those are the positions as shown in the chart. Let us now spend a few minutes examining the way this group worked. In many respects, of course, the German military leaders functioned in the same general manner as obtains in the military establishments of other large nations. General plans were made by the top staff officers and their assistants. In collaboration, the field generals or admirals who were entrusted with the execution of the plans a decision to wage a particular campaign would be made, needless to say, at the highest level. And the making of such a decision would involve political and diplomatic questions, as well as purely military considerations. When, for example, the decision was made to attack Poland, the top staff officers in Berlin and their assistants would work out general military plans for the campaign. These general plans would be transmitted to the, would be trans, these general plans would be transmitted to the commanders of the army groups and armies who would be in charge of the actual campaign. And then there would follow consultation between the top field commanders and the top staff officers at OKW and OKH in order to revise and perfect and refine the plans. The manner in which this group worked, involving as it did the interchange of ideas and recommendations between the top staff officers 
at OKW and OKH on the one hand, and the principal field commanders on the other hand, is graphically described in two affidavits by Field Marshal von Brockitsch. That is affidavit number four, which will be USA 535. I invite the tribunal's attention to these and we'll read them into the transcript. <coughs> Statement of 7 November, 1945. In April 1939, I was instructed by Hitler to start military preparations for a possible campaign against Poland. Work was immediately begun to prepare an operational and deployment plan. This was then presented to Hitler and approved by him as amended by a change which he desired. After the operational and deployment orders had been given to the two commanders of the army groups and the five commanders of the armies, Conferences took place with them about details in order to hear their desires and recommendations. After the outbreak of the war, I continued this policy of keeping in close and constant touch with the commanders in chief of army groups and of armies by personal visits to their headquarters as well as by telephone, teletype, or wireless. In this way, I was able to obtain their advice and their recommendations during the conduct of military operations. In fact, it was the accepted policy and common practice for the Commander-in-Chief of the Army to consult his subordinate Commanders-in-Chief and to maintain a constant exchange of ideas with them. The Commander-in-Chief of the Army and his Chief of Staff communicated with army groups and through them as well as directly with the armies. Through army groups on strategic and tactical matters, directly on questions affecting supply and administration of conquered territory occupied by the armies. An army group had no territorial jurisdiction. It had a relatively small staff which was concerned only with military operations. In all territorial matters, it was the commander-in-chief of the army and not of the army group who exercised jurisdiction. Signed, von Brockwich. It follows a supplement to my statement of 7 November. When Hitler had made a decision to support the realization of his political objectives, through military pressure or through the application of military force. The commander-in-chief of the army, if he was at all involved, ordinarily first received an appropriate oral briefing or an appropriate or oral command. Operational and deployment plans were next worked out in the OKH. After these plans had been presented to Hitler, generally by word of mouth, and had been approved by him, there followed a written order from the OKW to the three branches of the armed forces. In the meanwhile, the OKH began to transmit the operational and deployment plans to the army groups and armies involved. In my copy, it's OKW. That is an error, sir. It should be OKH. <coughs> Details of the operational and deployment plans were discussed by the OKH with the commanders in chief of the army groups and armies and with the chiefs of staff of these commanders. During the operations, the OKH maintained a constant exchange of ideas with the army groups by means of telephone, radio, and courier. The commander in chief of the army used every opportunity to maintain a personal exchange of ideas with the commanders of army groups, armies, and lower echelons by means of personal visits to them. 
in the war against Russia. The commanders of army groups and armies were individually and repeatedly called in by Hitler for consultation. Orders for all operational matters went from the OKH to army groups and for all matters concerning supply and territorial jurisdiction from the OKH directly to the armies. Signed, von Brauchitsch. The Oberbefehls harbor in the field, therefore, and in the case of the army, that means the commanders in chief of army groups and armies participated in planning and directed the execution of the plans, as those affidavits show. The Oberbefehls harbor were also the repositories of general executive power in the areas in which their army groups and armies were operating. In this connection, I invite the court's attention to 447 PS, which is already in evidence as US 135. Four four seven PS. This being a directive of thirteen March, nineteen forty one, signed by Keitel and issued by the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces. This directive sets out various regulations for the impending <laughs> operations against the Soviet Union, which were actually begun few months later on 22 June. Under paragraph Roman 1 of this document. Is this in the first book? The third book, book number three, Your Honor. The documents, Your Honor, <coughs> are in numerical order. The document books two and three. Document book two contains C and L. Document three, document book three, contains PS and R. This being 447 PS will be in document book three in numerical order within the PSs. Good. And within that document, under paragraph Roman one, the paragraph entitled Area of Operations and executive power, Volsienda Gewalt. The tribunal will find subparagraph one in which the following appears. That is page one of the translation, paragraph two. Quote, it is not contemplated to declare East Prussia and the general government an area of operations. However, in accordance with the unpublished Fuhrer orders from 19 and 21 October 1939, the Commander-in-Chief of the Army shall be authorized to take all measures necessary for the execution of his military aim and for the safeguarding of the troops. He may transfer his authority onto the Commanders-in-Chief, that in the original German is Oberbefehlshaber, of the army groups and armies. Orders of that kind have priority over all orders issued by civilian agencies. Your honors will see that <coughs> this executive power with priority over civilian agencies was vested in the commander-in-chief of the army with authority to transfer it to commanders-in-chief of army groups or armies to it the group as defined in the indictment. Further on in the document, under subparagraph 2A, the document states, that is the fourth paragraph on page one of the document, the area of operations created through the advance of the army beyond the frontiers of the Reich and the neighboring countries is to be limited in depth as far as possible. The Commander-in-Chief of the Army has the right to exercise the executive power, Volsienda Gewalt, in this area. 
and may transfer his authority onto the commanders in chief over the Fales Harbor of the army groups and armies. Perhaps that would be a convenient time to take over. Your, your Lordship, I have just one more document dealing with this subject of the structure of the group before passing on to the substantive charges of criminality. This document is C-78, which is already in evidence as USA-139. Um, what number did you say? C-78. C-78. C-78 P.S.? No, C, Your Honor. C as in Charles. C-78. That will be found in document book two. This document is the official command invitation to participate in the consultation at the Reich Chancellery on 14 June 1941, eight days prior to the attack on the Soviet Union. This is one of the meetings that was referred to in the last paragraph of the affidavits by Halder and Braukic, which were read into the record this morning. It is signed by Colonel Schmutt, the chief Wehrmacht adjutant to Hitler, and is dated at Berchtesgaden, 9 June 1941. It begins. Re-conference Barbarossa. That being the code word for the attack on the Soviet Union. The Fuhrer and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces has ordered reports on Barbarossa by the commanders of army groups and armies and naval and air commanders of equal rank. End of quotation. That is, as the tribunal will see, once again, the very group specified in the bottom line of the chart on the wall. Army groups, armies, and naval and air commands of similar rank. This document likewise includes a list of the participants in this conference. And I would just like, to, in closing on this subject, to run through that list to point out who the participants in this conference were and how closely they parallel the structure of the group as we have defined it in the indictment. The tribunal will see that the list of participants begins at the foot of page one of the translation. General Field Marshal von Braukic, who was then Commander-in-Chief of the Army and a member of the group. General Halder, who was Chief of the Army Staff, a member of the group. Then three subordinates who are not members of the group. Paulus, Heusinger, Gildenfeld. Navy, Captain Wagner who was Chief of the Operations Staff, Operations Division of the Naval War Staff, not a member of the group. From the air side, General Milk, State Secretary and General Inspector of the Air Force, again, not a member of the group. Yashanik, Chief of the General Staff of the Air Force and a member of the group, and two of his assistants. Passing over the page to the OKW, High Command of the Armed Forces, 
we find that Keitel, Yodel, Varlamont, all members of the group were present with an assistant from the general staff. And then four officers from the office of the adjutant who were not members of the group. Then we pass to the officers from the field commands. General von Falkenhorst, Army High Command Norway, a member of the group. General Stumpf, Luftwaffe 5, a member of the group. Rundstedt, Reichenau, Stultnagel, Schobert, Kleist, all from the Army, all members of the group. Air Force General Lohr, Luftwaffe 4, a member of the group. General Fromm and General Udet were not members. One was director of the Home Forces, commander of the Home Forces, and the other, the director <coughs> general of equipment and supply of the GAF. In the Navy, Raider, a member of the group, Fricka, chief of the Naval War Staff, and a member of the group, and a personal assistant who was not. Carls, Naval Group North, a member of the group. Likewise, Schmunt. And from the Army, Leib, Bush, Kirkler, Hupner, all members of the group, as Oberbefehlshaber. Keller, a member of the group. Bach, Kluger, Strauss, Guderian, Hott, Kesselring, all members of the group. And it will accordingly be seen that except for a few assisting officers of relatively junior rank. All the participants in these consultations were members of the group as defined in the indictment, and that, in fact, the participants included almost all the members <coughs> of the group who were concerned in the impending operations against the Soviet Union. I've now concluded the first part of the presentation to wit the description of the general staff and high command group and its composition and structure and general manner of functioning. And I turn now to the charges leveled against this group in the indictment. Appendix B charges that this group had a major responsibility for the planning, preparation, initiation, and waging of illegal wars set forth in counts one and two. And for the war crimes and crimes against humanity <coughs> detailed in counts three and four. In presenting the evidence in support of these charges, we must keep in mind that under the charter, the group may be declared criminal in connection with any act of which an individual defendant who is a member of the group may be convicted. The general staff and high command group is well represented among the individual defendants in this case. Five of the individual defendants, or one quarter of the individuals here, are members of the group. Taking them in the order in which they are listed, the first is the defendant, Goering. Goering is a defendant in this case in numerous capacities. He is a member of the general staff and high command group by reason of having been the commander in chief of the Air Force. From the time when the Air Force first came into the open and was officially established until about one month prior to the end of the war. During the last month of the war, he was replaced in this capacity by von Grein, who committed suicide shortly after his capture at the end of the war. During his charge with crimes under all counts of the indictment. The next listed defendant, who is a member of the group, is Keitel. He and the remaining three defendants are all four of them, in this case, primarily or solely in their military capacities. And all four of them are professional soldiers or sailors. Keitel was made chief of the high command of the German Armed Forces, or OKW, 
when the OKW was first set up in 1938. And he remained in that capacity throughout the period in question. He held the rank of field marshal throughout most of this period. And in addition to being the chief of OKW, he was a member of the Secret Cabinet Council and of the Council of Ministers for the Defense of the Reich. Keitel is charged with crimes under all four counts. The defendant Yodel is a career soldier. He was an Oberstleutnant or Lieutenant Colonel when the Nazis came to power and ultimately attained the rank of General Oberst or Colonel General. He became chief of the operations staff of the Wehrmacht and continued in that capacity throughout the war. He also was charged with crimes under all four counts. The other two defendants, who are members of this group, are from the nautical side. The defendant Raider is, in a sense, the senior member of the entire group, having been commander-in-chief of the German Navy as early as 1928. He attained the highest rank in the German Navy, Gross Admiral. He retired from the Supreme Command of the Navy in 1943, in January, and was replaced by Dönitz. Raider is charged under counts one, two, and three of the indictment. The last of the five defendants, Dönitz, was a relatively junior officer when the Nazis came to power. During the early years of the Nazi regime, he specialized in submarine activities and was in command of the U-boat arm when the war broke out. He rose steadily in the Navy and was chosen to succeed Raider when the latter retired in 1943. Dönitz then became C&C of the Navy and attained the rank of Gross Admiral. When the German armed forces collapsed near the end of the war, Dönitz succeeded Hitler as head of the German government. He is charged under counts one, two, and three of the indictment. Four of these five defendants are reasonably typical of the group as a whole. We must accept the defendant Goering, who is primarily a Nazi party politician, nourishing a hobby for aviation as a result of his career in 1914 to 18. But the other four made soldiering or sailoring their life work. They collaborated with and joined in the most important adventures of the Nazis, but they were not among the early party members. They differ in no essential respect from the other 125 members of the group. They are no doubt abler men in certain respects. They rose to the highest positions in the German armed forces, and all but Yodel attained the highest rank. but they will serve as excellent case studies and as representatives of the group. And we can examine their ideas as they have expressed them in these documents and their actions with fair assurance that these ideas and actions are characteristic of the other group members. <coughs> I turn first to the criminal activities of the general staff and high command group under counts one and two of the indictment. Their activities in planning and conspiring to wage illegal wars. Here my task is largely one of recapitulation. The general body of proof relating to aggressive war has already been laid before the tribunal by my colleague, Mr. Alderman, and the distinguished members of the British delegation. Many of the documents to which they drew the tribunal's attention showed the defendants here, who were members of the general staff and high command group, participating knowingly and willfully in crimes under counts one and two. I propose to avoid referring again to that evidence so far as I possibly can but I must refer to one or two of them again and to focus the tribunal's attention on the part which the 
general staff and high command group played in aggressive war crimes. Now it is, of course, the normal function of a military staff to prepare military plans. In peacetime, military staffs customarily concern themselves with the preparation of plans for attack or defense based on hypothetical contingencies. There's nothing criminal about carrying on these exercises or preparing these plans. That is not what the defendants and this group are charged with. We will show that the group agreed the Nazi objective of aggrandizing Germany by threat of force or force itself, and that they joined knowingly and enthusiastically in developing German armed might for this purpose. They were advised in advance of the Nazi plans to launch aggressive wars. They laid the military plans and directed the initiation and carrying on of the wars. These things we believe to be criminal under Article 6 of the Charter. <coughs> Aggressive war cannot be prepared or waged without intense activity on the part of all branches of the armed forces, and particularly by the high-ranking officers who control these forces. To the extent, therefore, that German preparation for and the waging of aggressive war are historical facts of common knowledge, or already proved, it necessarily follows that the general staff and high command group and the German armed forces participated therein. This is so notwithstanding the effort on the part of certain German military leaders to insist that until the troops marched, they sort of lived in an ivory tower, unwilling to see the direction to which their work led. The documents to which I will refer fully refute this. And moreover, some of these men now fully admit that they participated gladly with the Nazis because the Nazi aims coincided closely with their own. I think that the documents which Mr. Alderman read into the transcript already adequately reflect the purposes and objectives of the German General Staff and High Command Group during the period prior to the absorption of Austria. <coughs> during this period occurred, as is charged in the indictment, firstly, secret rearmament, including the training of military personnel production of war munitions, and the building of an air force. Secondly, the Goering announcement on 10 March 1935 that Germany was building a military air force. Third, the law for compulsory military service of 16 March 1935 fixing the peacetime strength of the German army at 500,000. Finally, fourth, the reoccupation of the Rhineland on 7 March 1936 and the refortification of that area. Those particular facts do not require judicial proof. They are historical facts. And likewise, the fact that it would have been impossible for the Nazis to achieve these things without cooperation by the armed forces is indisputable from the very nature of things. <coughs> Mr. Alderman described to the tribunal and read from numerous documents which illustrate these events. He included numerous documents 
concerning the secret expansion of the German Navy in violation of treaty limitations under the guidance of the defendant Rader. He also read the Secret Reich Defense Law, 2261 PS, already in the record as US 24, which was adopted on the same day that Germany unilaterally renounced the armament provisions of the Versailles Treaty. He read von Blomberg's plan, dated 2 May 1935, for the reoccupation of the Rhineland. That is C-159, U.S. 54, and Blomberg's orders under which the reoccupation was actually carried out. All these events, by obvious inference, required the closest collaboration between the military leaders and the Nazis. I need not labor that point further. But it is worthwhile, I think, to re-examine one or two of the documents which show the state of mind and the objectives of the German military leaders during this early period. One document, read from by Mr. Alderman, which reflects the viewpoint of the German Navy on the opportunities which Nazism afforded for rearmament so that Germany could achieve its objectives by force or threat of force is a memorandum published by the high command of the German Navy in 1937, entitled The Fight of the Navy Against Versailles. That is C-156, U.S. 41. The tribunal will recall this memorandum in which this official publication of the German Navy stated that only with the assistance of Hitler had it been possible to create the conditions for rearmament. The defendant Jodl has stated this better than I could possibly put it in his speech to the Gauleiters on 7 November 1943. That is in document L-172, U.S. 34, from which Mr. Alderman read at length. Nor were the high-ranking German officers unaware that the policies and objectives of the Nazis were leading Germany in the direction of war. I invite the court's attention to document C-23, which is already in the record as U.S. 49. This consists of some notes made by Admiral Karls of the German Navy in September 1938. <coughs> These notes were written by Admiral Karls by way of comment on a draft study of naval warfare against England. And they read in part as follows. That will be found, Your Lordship, on page three, the translation of document C-23. There is full agreement with the main theme of the study one, if, according to the Fuhrer's decision, Germany is to acquire a position as a world power, she needs not only sufficient colonial possessions, but also secure naval communications and secure access to the ocean. Two, both requirements can only be fulfilled in opposition to Anglo-French interests and would limit their position as world powers. It is unlikely that they can be achieved by peaceful means. 
the decision to make Germany a world power therefore forces upon us the necessity of making the corresponding preparations for war. Three, war against England means at the same time war against the empire, against France, probably against Russia as well, and a large number of countries overseas. In fact, against one half to one third of the whole world. It can only be justified to have a chance of success if it is prepared economically as well as politically and militarily and waged with the aim of conquering for Germany an outlet to the ocean. Now let us turn to the Air Force, having seen what the viewpoint of the Navy was. Parts of the German air staff during this pre-war period were developing even more radically aggressive plans for the aggrandizement of the Reich. Document L-43, GB-29, is a study prepared by the chief of a branch of the general staff of the Air Force called the organization staff. The study in question is a recommendation for the organization of the German Air Force in future years up to 1950. The recommendation is based on certain assumptions. And one assumption was that by 1950, the frontiers of Germany would be as shown on the map, which was attached as an enclosure to this study. There is only one copy of the map available, Your Honors, to be handed around. Court will note on this map that Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, and the Baltic coast up to the Gulf of Finland are all included within the borders of the Reich. The court will also note at page two of the document itself, that is L43, that the author envisaged the future peacetime organization of the German Air Force as comprising seven group commands, four of which lie within the borders of Germany proper at Berlin, Braunschweig, Munich, and Königsberg, but the three others are proposed to be at Vienna, Budapest, and Warsaw. Before turning to particular acts of aggression by the German armed forces, I want to stress once more the basic agreement and harmony between the Nazis and the German military leaders. Without this agreement on objectives, there might never have been a war. In this connection, I want to direct the tribunal's attention to an affidavit number three in document book one, which will be USA 536. By von Blomberg, formerly field marshal, Reich war minister, and Commander-in-Chief of the German Armed Forces until February 1938. I will read the affidavit into the transcript. From 1919, and particularly from 1924, three critical territorial questions <coughs> occupied attention in Germany. These were the questions of the Polish corridor, the Ruhr, and Memel. 
I myself, as well as the whole group of German staff officers, believe that these three questions, outstanding among which was the question of the Polish corridor, would have to be settled someday, if necessary, by force of arms. About 90% of the German people were of the same mind as the officers on the Polish question. A war to wipe out the desecration involved in the creation of the Polish corridor and to lessen the threat to separated East Prussia, surrounded by Poland and Lithuania, was regarded as a sacred duty, though a sad necessity. This was one of the chief reasons behind the partially secret rearmament, which began about 10 years before Hitler came to power and was accentuated under Nazi rule. Before 1938 to 39, the German generals were not opposed to Hitler. There was no reason to oppose Hitler since he produced the results which they desired. After this time, some generals began to condemn his methods and lost confidence in the power of his judgment. However, they failed as a group to take any definite stand against him, although a few of them tried to do so, and as a result had to pay for this with their lives or their positions. Shortly before my removal from the post of Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces in January 1938, Hitler asked me to recommend a successor. I suggested Goering, who was the ranking officer. But Hitler objected because of his lack of patience and diligence. I was replaced as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces by no officer, but Hitler personally took over my function as commander. Keitel was recommended by me as a chef de bureau. As far as I know, he was never named commander of the armed forces, but was always a chief of staff under Hitler, and in effect conducted the administrative functions of the Ministry of War. At my time, Keitel was not opposed to Hitler, and therefore was qualified to bring about a good understanding between Hitler and the armed forces, a thing which I myself desired and had furthered as Reichswehr minister and Reichskrieg minister. To do the opposite would have led to a civil war, for at that time the mass of the German people supported Hitler. Many are no longer willing to admit this, but it is the truth. As I heard, Keitel did not oppose any of Hitler's measures. He became a willing tool in Hitler's hands for every one of his decisions. He did not measure up to what might have been expected of him. The statement by von Blomberg, which I have just read, is paralleled closely by an affidavit <clears throat> by Colonel General Blaskowitz. That is affidavit number five in document book one, and will be USA 537. Blaskowitz commanded an army <coughs> in the campaign against Poland and in the campaign against France. He subsequently took command of an army group, Army Group G, in southern France. <coughs> and at the end of the war, he was in command of Army Group H, which had retreated beyond the Rhine. The first three paragraphs of his affidavit are substantially identical with the first three paragraphs of Blomberg's. 
And since they're available in all languages for expedition, I will start reading with paragraph four, where the affidavit uh, is on a different subject. After the annexation of Czechoslovakia, we hoped that the Polish question would be settled in a peaceful fashion through diplomatic means, since we believed that this time France and England would come to the assistance of their ally. As a matter of fact, we felt that if political negotiations came to nothing, the Polish question would unavoidably lead to war. That is not only with Poland herself, but also with the Western powers. When in the middle of June, I received an order from the OKH to prepare myself for an attack on Poland I knew that this war came even closer to the realm of possibility. <coughs> this conclusion was only strengthened by the Fuhrer's speech on 22 August on the Ober Salzburg, when it clearly seemed to be an actuality. Between the middle of June 1939 and 1 September 1939, the members of my staff who were engaged in preparations participated in various discussions which went on between OKH and the Army Group. During these discussions, such matters of a tactical, strategical, and general nature were discussed as had to do with my future position as Commander-in-Chief of the Eighth Army during the planned Polish campaign. During the Polish campaign, particularly during the Kutno operations, I was repeatedly in communication with the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, <coughs> and he, as well as the Fuhrer, visited my headquarters. In fact, it was the common practice for Commanders-in-Chief of Army groups and of armies to be asked from time to time for estimates of the situation and for their recommendations by telephone, teletype, or wireless as well as by personal calls. These front commanders-in-chief thus actually became advisors to the OKH in their own field, so that the position shown in the attached chart embraced that group, which was the actual advisory council of the high command of the German armed forces. The tribunal will note that the latter part of this affidavit, like those of Halder and Braukitsch, vouches for the accuracy of the structure and organization of the General Staff and High Command Group as described by the prosecution. The tribunal will also note that the Blomberg affidavit and the first part of the Blaskowitz affidavit make it clear beyond question that the military leaders of Germany knew of, approved, supported, and executed plans for the expansion of the armed forces beyond the limits set by treaties, that the objectives which they had in mind are obvious, that in these documents and affidavits we see the Nazis and the generals in agreement upon the basic objective of aggrandizing Germany by force or threat of force and collaborating to build up the armed might of Germany in order to make possible the subsequent acts of aggression. We turn now to an examination of those particular acts of aggression, which have already been described to the tribunal in general, with the particular purpose of noting participation in these criminal acts by the general staff and high command group. I may say, Your Lordship, that in going over this material, in order to save time, I propose to read from very few documents, to cite a large number of documents. And accordingly, when I cite them, I think there is probably no need for the tribunal to try to find them among the documents before it. They are most of them documents already in evidence, and I propose to cite them merely for purpose of recapitulation, without reading very much. The tribunal will recall that Mr. Alderman read into the transcript 
portions of the document, 386 PS, US 25, consisting of notes by Colonel Husbach on a conference which was held in the German Chancellery in Berlin on the 5th of November, 1937. Hitler presided at this conference, which is a small and highly secret one. And the only other participants were the four principal military leaders and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the defendant Neurath. The four chief leaders of the armed forces, Blomberg, who was then Reich Minister for War, and the commanders in chief of the three branches, of the armed forces. Von Fritsch for the <coughs> Army, Raider for the Navy, Goering for the Air Force were present. Hitler embarked on a general discussion of Germany's diplomatic and military policy and stated that the conquest of Austria and Czechoslovakia was an essential preliminary for the improvement of our military position and in order to remove any threat from the flanks. The military and political advantages which were envisaged included the acquisition of a new source of food, shorter and better frontiers, the release of troops for other tasks, and the possibility of forming new divisions from the population of the conquered territories. Blomberg and von Fritsch joined in the discussion. And von Fritsch stated that he was making a study to investigate the possibilities of carrying out operations against Czechoslovakia, with special consideration for the conquest of the Czechoslovakian system of fortifications. The following spring, March 1938, the German plans with respect to Austria came to fruition. Mr. Alderman has already read into the record portions of the diary kept by the defendant Yoden. The portion here in question is 1780 PS, US 72. And this diary shows the participation of the German military leaders in the absorption of Austria. As is shown by Yodel's diary entry for 11 February 1938, the defendant Keitel and two other important generals were present at the Obersalzburg meeting between Schirschnig and Hitler, and the purpose is shown clearly by the entry which recites that in the evening and on 12 February, General Keitel, General von Reichenau, and Sperler are at the Obersalzburg. Schuschnigg, together with G. Schmidt, are again being put under heaviest political and military pressure. At 2300 hours, Schuschnigg signs protocol. The General von Reichenau, referred to there, was at this time the head, the, the commander of Wehrkreis 7, one of the military districts into which Germany was divided. He subsequently commanded the 10th Army in Poland, the 6th Army in France, and was a member of the group as defined in the indictment. Sperl, Sperle, was in Spain during the Civil War then commanded Luftwaffe III, the third German air fleet, practically throughout the war, also a member of the group. Two days later, Keitel and other military leaders were preparing proposals to be submitted to Hitler, which would give the Austrian government the impression that Germany would resort to force 
unless the Schuschnigg Agreement was ratified in Vienna. These proposals are embodied in a document dated February 14, 1938. 1775 PS, US 73, and signed by Keitel. Portions of Keitel's proposals to the Fuhrer are as follows. To take no real preparatory measures in the Army or Luftwaffe. No troop movements or redeployments. Spread false, but quite credible news, which may lead to the conclusion of military operations against Austria. A, through V-men, that means agents, in Austria, through our customs personnel at the frontier, through traveling agents. And passing down the document to Arabic 4, Keitel proposed, quote, order a very active make-believe wireless exchange in Verkreis 7 and between Berlin and Munich. Five, real maneuvers, training flights, and winter maneuvers of the mountain troops near the frontier. Six, Admiral Canaris has to be ready beginning on February 14th in the service command headquarters in order to carry out measures given by order of the chief of OKW. End of quote. As Yodel's diary shows under the entry for 14 February, these deceptive maneuvers were very effective and created in Austria the impression that these threats of force might be expected to create. About a month later, armed intervention was precipitated by Schuschnigg's decision to hold a plebiscite in Austria. Hitler ordered mobilization in accordance with the pre-existing plans for the invasion of Austria, these plans being known as Case Otto, in order to absorb Austria and stop the plebiscite. Yodel's diary, under the entry for 10 March 1938, tells us as follows. That is at page two of the document. Let's go on. By surprise, and without consulting his ministers, Schuschnigg ordered a plebiscite for Sunday, 13 March, which should bring a strong majority for the legitimists. They have the date, 10 March, 10 March. Page two. <clears throat> By surprise and without consulting his ministers, Schuschnigg ordered a plebiscite for Sunday, 13 March, which should bring a strong majority for the legitimists in the absence of plan or preparation. Fuhrer is determined not to tolerate it. The same night, March 9 to 10, he calls for Goering. General von Reichenau is ordered to come. General von Reichenau is called back from the Cairo Olympic Committee. General von Schobert is ordered to come, as well as Minister Gleis Horstenau, who was with the Gauleiter Berkel in the Palatinate. <coughs> End of quote. The General von Schobert referred to succeeded General Reichenau as commander of Verkreis 7 commanded the 11th Army in Russia in the Soviet Union and was a member of the group in that capacity.
The invasion of Austria differs from the other German acts of aggression in that the invasion was not closely scheduled and timed in advance. This is the case simply because the invasion was precipitated by an outside event, that being Schuschnigg's order for the publicist. But although for this reason, the element of deliberately timed planning is lacking, the foregoing documents make clear the participation of the military leaders at all stages. At the small policy meeting of November 1937, when Hitler's general program for Austria and Czechoslovakia is outlined. The only, other pr only others present were the four principal military leaders and the foreign secretary. In February, Keitel, Reichenau, Sperle are all present to help subject Schuschnigg to the heaviest military pressure. Keitel and others immediately thereafter work out and execute a program of military threat and deception to frighten the Austrian government into acceptance of the Schuschnigg Protocol. When the actual invasion took place, it was, of course, directed by the military leaders and executed by the armed forces. <coughs> and we are indebted to Yodel, the defendant Yodel, for a clear statement of why the German military leaders we're only too delighted to join with the Nazis in bringing about the end of Austrian independence. In his lecture in November 1943 to the Gauleiters, which appears in L172, which is US 34, Jodl explained that is at page five, paragraph three of the translation. I quote, the Austrian Anschluss in its turn brought with it not only fulfillment of an old national aim, but also had the effect both of reinforcing our strategic position, our fighting strength, and of materially improving our strategic position. Whereas up to then, the territory of Czechoslovakia had projected in a most menacing way right into Germany, wasp waste in the direction of France and an air base for the Allies, in particular Russia, Czechoslovakia herself was now enclosed by pincers. Its own strategic position had now become so unfavorable that she was bound to fall a victim to any attack pressed home with rigor before effective aid from the West could be expected to arrive. The foregoing extract from Yodel's speech makes a good transition to the case of Czechoslovakia, case Green, Fall Green. I propose to treat this very briefly. Mr. Alderman has covered the general story of German aggression against Czechoslovakia very fully, and the documents he read from are full of evidence showing knowing participation in this venture by Keitel, Jodl, and other members of the group. Once again, the Hussbach minutes of the conference between Hitler and the four principal German military leaders, 386 PS, US 25, may be called to mind. Austria and Czechoslovakia were then listed as the most proximate victims of German aggression. After the absorption of Austria, Hitler as head of the state and Keitel, as chief of all the armed forces, lost no time in turning their attention to Czechoslovakia. From this point on, 
Nearly the whole story is contained in the Schmunt file, 388 PS, US 26, and Yodel's diary, both of which have been read from extensively. And these two sources of information go far, I think, to demolish what is urged in defense of the military defendants and the general staff and high command group. They seek to create the impression that the German generals were pure military technicians, that they were not interested in or not informed about political and diplomatic considerations, <clears throat> that they prepared plans for military attack or defense on a purely hypothetical basis. They say all this in order to suggest that they did not share and could not estimate Hitler's aggressive intentions, that they carried out politically conceived orders like military automatons with no idea whether the wars they launched were aggressive or not. When these arguments are made, Your Honors, may I respectfully suggest read the Big Schmunt file, read Yodel's diary. They make it abundantly clear that aggressive designs were conceived jointly between the Nazis and the generals, that the military leaders were fully posted on the aggressive intentions of the Nazis, that they were fully informed of political and diplomatic developments, that indeed German generals had a strange habit of turning up at diplomatic foregatherings, and indeed, if the documents didn't show these things, a moment's thought must show them to be true. <coughs> a highly successful program of conquest depends on armed might. It cannot be executed with an unprepared, weak, or recalcitrant military leadership. It has, of course, been said that war is too important a business to be left to soldiers alone. That is no doubt true. But it is equally true that aggressive diplomacy is far too dangerous a business to be conducted without military advice and support. No doubt some of the German generals had qualms about Hitler's timing. And the boldness of some of his moves. Some of these doubts are rather interestingly reflected in an entry from Yodel's diary, which has not yet been read. That is 1780 PS again, the entry for 10 August, 1938. It appears at page four of the translation of 1780 PS. Ten August, nineteen thirty eight. The Army Chiefs and the Chiefs of the Air Force Groups, Lieutenant Colonel Yashanik and myself, are ordered to the Berikhov. After dinner, the Fuhrer makes a speech lasting for almost three hours, in which he develops his political thoughts. The subsequent attempts to draw the Fuhrer's attention to the defects of our preparation, which are undertaken by a few generals of the army, are rather unfortunate. This applies especially to the remarks of General Wietersheim, in which, to top it off, he claims to quote from General Adams that the Western fortifications can be only held for three weeks. The Fuhrer becomes very indignant and flames up. 
bursting into the remark that in such a case, the whole army would not be good for anything. I assure you, General, the position will not only be held for three weeks, but for three years. The cause of this despondent opinion, which unfortunately enough is held widely within the Army staff, is based on various reasons. First of all, it, the General Staff, is restrained by old memories. Political considerations play a part as well, instead of obeying and executing its military mission. That is certainly done with traditional devotion, but the vigor of the soul is lacking because in the end they do not believe in the genius of the Fuhrer. And one does perhaps compare him with Charles XII. And since water flows downhill, this defeatism may not only possibly cause immense political damage, for the opposition between the general's opinion and that of the Fuhrer is common talk. But may also constitute a danger for the morale of the troops. But I have no doubt that the Fuhrer will be able to boost the morale of the people in an unexpected way when the right moment comes." End of quote. Shall we break off now for 10 minutes?